which means peace be unto you. Shalom is a rich Hebrew word. and You can go to our websites and download uh, the meanings of shalom. It uh, means hello, means goodbye, means peace, tranquility, contentment. Uh, may you be well. May you be whole. May you be uh, safe. Uh, may you prosper spiritually and materially. Many meanings uh, of that word. And it is a good way, shalom, a good way to greet one another from a distance now uh, as we maintain social distance. Now, let's just ask God's blessings upon our time before we begin our talk today. Lord God, we give you thanks for the blessings of another day. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy unto us. And now as we come to your word, once again, we pray Psalm 119, verse 18. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from your word. There are wondrous things in your word, but we will not behold them. We will not understand them unless you give us illumination by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so we ask that you would open our eyes, grant that we may behold wondrous things from your word. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Today we continue... Uh, in our series on the coronavirus, and we come to uh, message five. Uh, the other four messages are available uh, on our uh, website. Uh, you can view them uh, anytime you like, listen to them or view them uh, on, on, on video. And now I want to continue uh, to talk to you about the coronavirus in relation to Uh, the Hebrew noun that is translated pestilence in our English Bibles. And uh, this word occurs 49 times in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Old Testament. And uh, let me just read two of the places uh, that uh, the word occurs. And that one is in Amos chapter 4, verse 10. And in our last study, I encourage you to uh, master... Uh, Amos chapter 4 and also Deuteronomy chapter 28 in relation to the coronavirus. All right, Amos chapter 4 verse 10, God is speaking and God says, I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses And I have made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils. Yet have you not returned to me. And then in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 13. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence. Among my people. Now in Amos chapter 4 verse 10 and in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 13. The word pestilence translates the Hebrew noun deber. And of course if you read Hebrew and you make a distinction between a bet and a vet. Then it's deber. In fact in the Tanakh it's deber. D-E-V-E-R. However... Since the Strong's uh, Concordance in 1698, and most lexicons uh, or dictionaries uh, will say de bear, D E B E R. So we'll use that uh, pronunciation, D E B E R. Now, what does this Hebrew noun mean? Number one, it means epidemic, disease, destruction. Death, bubonic plague, and pandemic. Those are the meanings of deber, D-E-B-E-R. And according to the Dictionary of Biblical Languages, I quote, deber means 
a pandemic occurrence of sickness that causes widespread death, often with the associative meaning of judgment from God. Now, according to the enhanced Strong's lexicon, the bear occurs 49 times in the Hebrew Old Testament called the Tanakh. The authorized version, or the Old King James Version, translates the bear pestilence 47 times. 47 times. And uh, in our last study, I gave you the 49 uh, places where the bear occurs. And of course, in the O King James Version, 47 of those 49 times, it is translated pestilence. Uh, one time, uh, it is translated plague in Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. That is in the authorized O, o King James Version. And then in Exodus chapter 9, verse 3, it's translated M U R R A I N. Uh, which is a cattle disease. And so you can just take a concordance if you did not download those references or occurrences that I gave you. You can just take a concordance and uh, uh, record the uh, 47 occurrences in the Old King James. It's going to be 47 times it's translated pestilence. And so you can look up all of those and then you can examine or, or stu study the verses in whatever translation you like. And of course, remember, uh, there are two other translations of the word in the authorized version. Hosea 13, 14, again, it is plague, and then of course, Exodus 9, 3. All of the other occurrences, uh, the old King James will use the English word pestilence to do the or make the uh, translation. Now today, uh, I'd like to look uh, with you at uh, as some causes of the bear, pandemics, some consequences, and then some cures. What, what's the solution? Now, causes of the bear, or in, uh, pandemics, in the Bible, and in, in our last study, I uh, encourage you to uh, look up all of those different occurrences and to notice the uh, connection of uh, the word with God. Uh, notice the connection of the word with the warnings of God, the discipline of God, and the judgments of God. And uh, to uh, notice... Uh, how that word is used along with uh, famine and sword, meaning, uh, meaning war. Now, some of the causes, and one of the, 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 main, the main cause, the cause, main, the main cause, sin. Sin. Wherever you find this, 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 in most places where you find this word occurring, or, or, or it's connected with God, sin is going to be the main cause. Always, sins are always the cause. Now, a simple definition of sin is doing what God said not to do or failing to do what God said do. That's a simple definition of sin. Now, different, there are different Hebrew and Greek words uh, that, are, that, are, that are used for sin, but basically, mainly, that's what it is. We're failing to do what God said do or we're doing what God said not to do. And God takes all sin seriously. Uh, God doesn't do things the way that we do. In Isaiah uh, 55, <clears throat> verses 8 and 9, God says there, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. You know, as, as high as the heaven is from the earth, that's how, how, how my thoughts are above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. So God doesn't think the way that we do. He, he takes all sin seriously. Consider Adam and Eve. What did they eat? All they did was ate of some fruit that God said not to eat of. That's all they did. And sin was brought into the world. Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death is passed upon all men, for that all have sin. And then Moses. 
God told him to speak to a rock. And Moses, in his anger and frustration, he hit the rock. And because of that sin, Moses was not able to take the people into the promised land. Uzzah, David, was transported in the ark in a manner that was not consistent with the word of God. David did not follow God's instructions as to how the ark, which was a symbol of the presence of God, how it was to be transported. It wasn't supposed to be touched. Uh, there were poles that were uh, inserted on some rings uh, uh, to lift it and, and, and to convey it from one place to another. It wasn't supposed to be touched. And here, David is transporting the ark. It's on a cart. The oxen stumble, and the ark was about to fall off in Uzzah. This holy man simply reached out and touched it. But God said, no one's to touch it. He died. God takes all sin seriously. And then in 2 Samuel 11 and 12, read about the sin of David and some of the consequences. God takes all sin seriously. And then when we come to the New Testament, Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, all they did was just lie about the amount of money that they were given. They just lied about it. And they died. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the church at Corinth, they were coming to the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. The manner. And Paul said, because of this, many of you are sick and many of you sleep, which is a euphemism for death. God takes all sin seriously. And one of the, uh, uh, one of the words for sin is transgression. And in a, trans a transgression is stepping over a line. You know, God sets a line, and when you step over that line, you become a transgressor. In the eyes of God, in the eyes of God, when we drive one mile over the speed limit, we become a transgressor in the eyes of God. God takes all sin seriously. And the reason that we become a transgressor because God says that we are to obey the laws of the land except when those laws conflict with the laws of God. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. And of course, in Acts chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, chapter 5, verse 29, uh, we're told there that, you know, when there's a conflict, we're to obey God rather than men. But only when there's a conflict. When there's a conflict between the laws of the land, the ordinances, which, which in, involves the, include the speed limit. When, 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 the, when the government and, and, and when Paul and Peter wrote, there was a wicked governor, governor in power. It was, it, Rome, it was, it was wicked. It was a wicked emperor. And yet they said, let every soul be subject to the, the higher powers, the ordinances, all of those things. And so we are to obey the laws of the land, except when those laws conflict with the laws of God. And, and when we fail to obey the laws of the land, it's like it's a sin. We're being disobedient to God. And right now I know uh, Hebrews 10.25 says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Well... We're not to forsake the symbol of ourselves together as the manner of some is. I don't believe that the writer of Hebrews would have said that if there was, if there was a possibility of a virus being spread or transmitted to someone else. And so there were many reasons why people were forsaking the assembly of ourselves, but a virus was not one of them. And I don't believe that that command would have been given if there had been the possibility of spreading a virus. And I know that there's some who believe that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we're not to obey this, uh, the, the laws of the land with regard to distances and, and, and all of those kinds of things. And I respect them. I, I highly respect those who hold that position uh, that we've got to obey um, Hebrews 10, 25, and uh, there's a conflict here. Uh, I do not see a conflict there. Because you see, <clears throat> uh, 
God's sovereignty does not cancel human responsibility. In Acts chapter 27, God told Paul that everyone on that sinking ship that was in a storm were going to be saved. And yet, when some of the crew members attempted to abandon the ship, Paul said to the centurion, except these remain on the ship, we cannot be saved. The the sovereignty of God doesn't cancel human responsibility. Now, God just said, everybody's going to be saved. But then Paul says, if everybody does not remain on the ship, we cannot be saved. And so we've got to be responsible. Now, God's sovereignty doesn't cancel human responsibility. And so sin's the, the main cause, the main reason for uh, epidemics in the Bible or, or pandemics. Sin was the, main, was the main cause, and God takes all sin uh, uh, seriously. And uh, I'd like you to just read, and again, sin is doing what God said not do or failing to do what God said do. I'd like you to read Ephesians or Ephesians chapters 4, 5, and 6. And as you read those three chapters, 4, 5, and 6, ask yourself, am I obeying this command? There are commands in those, in those chapters. Ask yourself, am I obeying uh, these commands? For example, uh, there's a command in uh, uh, Ephesians 5, 18. Be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be filled uh, with the Holy Spirit of God. Be filled. And, and be filled, those two words translate the Greek verb pleruste. And the basic verb is plerao. And that verb is, number one, it's in the imperative mood, which means that it is a command. Number two, it is plural, which means that Paul's talking to everyone in the church, the children, everybody in the church. Married, single, elder, everybody in the church. And then third, it's in the present tense. And a Greek verb in the present tense means continuous action in the present, moment by moment action. And then four, it's in the passive voice. As we yield to the Holy Spirit, uh, he fills us. And out of all of the commands in the Bible, I believe that that is among the one that is most disobeyed is to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Every, moment by moment, when we cook, when we eat, when we drive, when we shop, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we're to be under his control, under his uh, influence. And so again, God doesn't view sin the way that we view uh, sin. Three common sins that you will find uh, that brought about pandemics. One, idolatry. Two, child sacrifice or the shedding of innocent blood. And three, neglect of the poor. Now, idolatry. And an idol is any person, place, or thing that we value more than God. Any person, place, or thing that we value more than God. In the eyes of God, that is an idol. Whatever we value more than God. And in worship, I did a series a number of years ago on worship, and I just took the word worship, looked it up, and I just observed what people did when they worship and why did they do it. And, and one of my definitions of, uh, of worship I got from the uh, first chapter of Job is that worship, again, worship is valuing God more than anything or anyone in all the world. Job was able to worship after he lost Three daughters, seven sons, everything that he had, he was able to worship because he still had what he valued most. Yes, he valued his children. Yes, he loved his children. But he loved God more. And so when he lost everything, he could worship because he still had what he valued most. And I find it very interesting to note that God has shut down many of the things that we value more than him. Shut him down. Many of the things that we value more than him. And once again, an idol can be any person, place, or thing that we value more than God. Jesus said in Matthew 22, the greatest commandment is to love God with all that is is in you, you see. Your your home can be your, your God, your idol. Your car 
can be your idol. Your children can be your idol. Sports can be your idol. Anything. Your lawn. Your lawn more. Anything that you value, that you think about more than God can be an idol. And then child sacrifice. Oh, I don't have time to go into details on it. But please do a study of, on child sacrifice in the, in, the, in the nations that practice a child sacrifice. How they did their babies. Their babies. Look at what they did with their babies. Just look at it. The, the, the Amorites, the, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Jebusites. And finally, many of the Israelites ad, ad, adopted some of these practices. Do a study on that. And then neglect of the poor. Now, God tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus tells us in Matthew 26, 11, Mark 14, 7, and in John, in, in John 12, 8, that the poor you will have with you always. And so we're not going to eliminate the poor. Jesus, in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, three places in the New Testament, we're told we're not going to eliminate the poor. So God doesn't expect us to eliminate the poor. But it is sin not to care for them. Read Proverbs chapter 4, chapters 14 through 31. Read them. And notice what God says about the poor and the needy and poverty. So these were the main sins. Idolatry, child sacrifice, shedding of innocent blood, neglect of the poor. Now, there were many others, but, but those were the main ones that were common among all the nations. And we, we've seen in a previous study that God judges when the cup of iniquity is full. God judges when the cup of iniquity is full. Please study, read Jeremiah and, uh, and, and just notice the sins that fill the cup for the southern kingdom of Israel who were eventually taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Study Ezekiel and, and Amos and notice the sins that fill the cup that cause the northern kingdom to be taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And then in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50, you'll see there that there were five sins that filled the cup for Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know, when you look at those sins, if when you study those sins, you know, like sin like, like gluttony, which is my sin. Eating more than necessary. That is a sin. Eating more than necessary. Gluttony. I love to eat. And, and I, I used to be a chef and I can burn, as they say. And my food's good. I, it, it comes out just the way I want. And so I, over, I tend to overeat. And so I struggle with this every day. And I, and, and, and I pray about it. I confess that sin every day. Gluttony. And you know what? Neglect of the poor. Pride. Idleness, those were the sins. And the fifth one, please study the fifth one, the one that was the, uh, that was the final straw. Study that one. And, and you know, when you look at the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, I mean, which many of us would, would, would regard as a hey, big deal. I mean, that's, that's a sin. Gluttony is a sin. Idleness is a sin. Neglect of the poor. I mean, you look at the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then you look at the sins of America, you can understand why Ruth Graham, the late Ruth Graham, the wife of the late Billy Graham said, if God doesn't judge America, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. You'll understand why she said that. Now, cure. Let's get to the cure. Let's get to the cure. What is the cure? What is the cure? Well, there's another consequence that I should... Uh, did I give you consequences? I don't think I did. Some of the consequences of uh, the bear. Number one, quickly, the nations that had the most truth, the most light, were judged the most severely. 
uh, God's people were judged more severely than the other surrounding nation because God's people had more truth. They had more light. They had more knowledge of God uh, than the other nations. And so they were judged more, more harshly. And in America, don't be surprised if America doesn't suffer from this virus more than any other nation because this nation has more freedom, has been blessed more, and has more truth, more knowledge of God. I mean, you can get, you can get Bibles on your phone, churches everywhere, on, on TV, radio. I mean, we've got all kinds of knowledge here. And we will be judged more or we will be punished more or disciplined more than other nations that do not have as much light as we have and have not been blessed. God has blessed America greater than other nations. So we have a greater uh, responsibility. And so consequences, harsher judgment, another consequence Another consequence is that everyone, when, when God disciplines or judges, everyone suffers. Everyone suffers. And because everyone suffers, this is why we need to be concerned about what goes, goes on in the nation. And then secondly, because everyone suffers, we need to be cautious. We need to follow the guidelines. Again, God's sovereignty does not cancel human responsibility. And if you look, when the flood came, God shut Noah and his family up in the ark. And, and the ten plagues in Egypt, uh, they were designed to attack the gods of Egypt. They were also designed uh, to deliver God's people uh, from Egypt. And uh, God did protect them in Goshen. But for that final plague, they were to shut, get shut up also. If they had been outside, they would have died. But the, everyone, in the, the Hebrews, they had to be in a house where blood had been applied to the doorframe. If they had gone outside, they would have died. The sovereignty of God doesn't cancel human responsibility. And because everyone suffers when God disciplines, judges, or warns a nation, we need to be cautious and we need to follow the guidelines. Okay. Some of the cures, the cures, the cures. Three key words. Recognize, repent, return. Recognize, repent, return. And, and recognize our personal sins and confess them. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John 1, 9. Proverbs 28, 13. If we confess, uh, he that covers his sin shall not prosper, but he who, who confesses and forsakes him will have mercy. We need to co confess our personal sins, like driving over the speed limit, gluttony, neglect of the poor, Walking in the flesh rather than in the spirit. Oh, there's just so many. Failing to uh, put God first. Matthew 6.33. When we have uh, an issue with somebody. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. If someone has something against us, we're to go to them. Matthew chapter 18. If we have something against somebody, we're to go to them, not everybody else. Confess and forsake our sins. And then repent. And repent is change of mind, change of heart, change of attitude. And very interesting to note that in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, Jesus said to five of the churches, repent or else. Five of the seven churches, Jesus said to the churches, commanded them, repent or else. And please read what Jesus had to say about repentance in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Now, once again, recognize, repent, return. Return to God. This nation has drifted away from God. Many of us, we've drifted away from God. We've drifted away from God, and we need to return. And I believe that if we, the church, if we will recognize, repent, return, I believe that God will heal the land, either directly or indirectly through means. And many times in the Bible, as, you know, God used means. Uh, in Exodus chapter 15, uh, God says, I'm your healer, I'm your doctor, and yet he used means. He used a tree to heal the waters. Hezekiah, it was a lump of figs. Naaman, seven times dipped in the Jordan River. Many times God used means to heal. And I believe that God can heal uh, of the coronavirus. He can do it directly if he chooses to. Or he can do it indirectly through the medical profession. But God has got to do it. 
And I do believe that if God's people will obey 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, my people, not the non-believers, not the atheists, not the agnostics, my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I forgive their sins. I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins, and I'll heal the land. Now, death in the Bible means separation, not annihilation. We all, if we're not raptured, we all are going to die one day. And we're going to go somewhere. We're going to go to heaven or to hell. One of those places, we're going to go, everybody. It is appointed unto man once to die, after this, to judgment. There are a few exceptions in the Old Testament, a few in the New. But as a rule, wants to die, after this, to judgment. John, John, uh, 1 John tells us that we can know before we go. And our destination is determined before we die, not after. Look at Luke chapter 16. The destination is determined before death. And Jesus said, and this is narrow, but he said it. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. John 1.12, as many as received him, Jesus, to them, he gave the authority to become the technetheu, the children of God. We become children of God when we receive the Son of God. And if you are here and you have, if you've never received him, Right now, where you are, just ask Jesus. Lord Jesus, number one, I want to receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. Give me the grace to repent. Give me the grace to believe. Give me the grace to receive. Come into my heart and change me. In your name I pray. Amen. And if you pray that prayer, and it's Jesus who saves now, not a prayer. Prayer just sort of seals it. Find a church somewhere where the word of God is taught so that you can grow in grace. We're commanded in Peter, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, just before I go, I want to give the Arianic blessing or benediction. Uh, in Numbers chapter 6, God said to uh, Aaron, I'm going to bless the people, but these are the words that you're to use. These are the words that you're to use, and those words were in Hebrew. And of course, we're told that when Aaron blessed the congregation, he raised his hands, symbolizing that he was touching them and bestowing God's blessings upon them. In the last chapter in Luke, Jesus blessed his disciples before he ascended. He lifted up his hands. And parent brought their children to Jesus on one occasion so that Jesus could touch them and bless them. Jacob, when he blessed his grandsons, he laid his hands on them. And so the raised hands simply means I'm touching you, I'm laying hands on you, but God is the blesser. I'm just the instrument. Arianic blessing. Yeva rekaka ernai vejishmerika. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. New Testament Church of Milwaukee is a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. If you enjoyed today's message and would like to view it again or view previous messages, please visit our website, newtchurch.org, or follow us on Facebook at New Testament Church of Milwaukee. To support our outreach, you can also go to newtchurch.org. May God bless you and keep you safe.